Hello, this is Will Chow, and welcome to Will's Personal Development Podcast. I'm here with a very special guest, Dr. Anders Ericsson. Uh, He is the author of a fantastic book called Peak, Secrets from the New Science of Expertise. Um, I'm very excited to have him on because this book is incredibly uh, useful and and unique in how it deals with and teaches us about uh, becoming a master. Um, uh, Dr. Ericsson, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, you know, I've been studying uh, people who are exceptionally good at various things for the last uh, 40 years. And we kind of started looking at how normal college students could become the best in the world by training memory tasks. Uh, And then we started asking questions about whether the same kind of processes that we observed uh, with the improvement in memory, could that methodology could be applied to other types of expertise like chess, sports, uh, music, uh, and pretty much anything where you could argue that somebody is reliably better than somebody else. So they actually are able to perform at a higher level consistently. Yeah, and, and that's one thing I, I really liked about this, this book. I think... Um, uh, I, I have studied um, the t- tips of success um, of the all, all the articles and, and content on the internet for many, many years. And so I thought that there wouldn't be any tips out there that surprised me. Um, but there was many things in this book that um, I was hearing and it was a very new perspective on, on how to succeed. And we'll dive into that. But um, uh, just for my listeners out there, you, you might be surprised about some of the things that you assume because you always hear s- these phrases from successful people like uh, you, you got to work harder and, and uh, persist. So so uh, my first question to you is um, in terms of um, uh, talent versus hard work, I think one of the, the big things that a lot of people are still convinced is that um, talent is incredibly important. Um, and if not talent, at least genetics, you know, if you have to be a certain height to be a basketball player and so forth. Um, what are your thoughts on that topic? Well, you know, I, I think I've taken a sort of a skeptical view, which is essentially uh, accepting, you know, there's pretty good evidence that in actually most sports, uh, there is an ideal height. You know, basketball, you need to be tall. But it turns out that in gymnastics, you're actually favored if you're short. Uh, and, and if we look at other uh, kind of sports activities, uh, there is kind of a seemingly ideal height. And uh, we don't know any kind of evidence here that you can actually control your height by any kind of training. So that obviously would have kind of a genetic basis. But when it comes to Other things, I have to say that I'm just looking for solid evidence. And what I find is that the evidence that people propose isn't that kind of hard where you actually demonstrate that somebody just simply lacks something that would not allow them to develop their performance. Uh, But ultimately, I think we'll know more. But I think in the last... uh, decades, it's becoming clear that these efforts to describe the whole DNA and find individual genes that seems to be necessary for somebody to be successful in sports, that that project has been encountering a lot of difficulties. They don't find genes that explain a lot of uh, variance in performance. So at the moment, People don't know, you know, how to prove that there's really genetic differences between individuals that explain the differences in performance. We also know that <clears throat> epigenetics, that actually engaging in practice and other activities seems to activate genes that then have an effect. But that means that genes that everyone has actually seems to influence, uh, you know, the development of kind of the bodies that we see with muscles of athletes. 
So it's not, you know, necessarily that you're born in a unique way that makes a difference. It seems actually increasingly true that it's the genes that you activate by engaging in training where you actually push the body outside of this comfort zone that seems to stimulate now genes to be expressed and in turn now having favorable physiological differences. One of the um, uh, parts of your book goes into um, portraying uh, Mozart and other prodigies. And um, I think it's it was a good argument for um, the fact that maybe prodigies um, and the natural talent that is assumed to go with them isn't entirely natural talent, but um, simply a, a representation of all the work that they put in, um, oftentimes just starting from a much earlier age. Um, so uh, could you could you talk about um, you know some of these prodigies and how you know some of these uh, the application of what they've done is is in what um, what's coined as deliberate practice um, in the book? Yeah. So. So one of the things that we found when we looked at the prodigies is that every prodigy, there's this very kind of interesting learning environment that was created. So Wolfgang's father was actually one of the pioneers when it came to methods for training younger children to succeed. So uh, Wolfgang was kind of a product of his sort of theories about how you, with early training, was able to produce now a performance that, you know, at least at that time, was something that you would only see with adults, and now you would see a young child being able to uh, produce that performance. But it's very clear that that didn't just spontaneously emerge, but that was actually something that was a result here of you know, very intense interaction between Mozart's father and Mozart, actually training him and providing him now with the kind of support that we see is something that often characterizes exceptional performers in any domain. That you can point to a father or a teacher or somebody that now helped this individual kind of engage in the right type of practice to develop that sequence of skills that ultimately led them now to reach a very high level. Yeah, and, and speaking of deliberate practice, I think um, one thing that we've we've heard in countless times from successful people is a sort of like broad advice to just outwork everyone and work 18 hour days and so forth. Um, but what I, I found it very fascinating is that um, when deliberate practice is mentioned in this book, there's a very specific set of requirements for what would be cons it would be considered under. For example, um, it has to be in a you know a field that has a lot of you know specific uh, steps that you can teach and learn from, like chess or piano. And then you have to have a teacher that is constantly giving feedback and so forth. Um, could you talk about um, how? how this, these uh, requirements uh, came about and why they're important? Well, I think that gets to this idea that we have been uh, exploring, that in order to explain how somebody changes their performance, you have to explain the kind of process that drives this change in performance in a direction that you really want. And I think that's one of the problems that any performer or individual has is sort of knowing where to go in order to get better. And that's where a teacher who now can draw on centuries of accumulated wisdom about what types of practice really produces uh, changes that you, know, you would like to uh, attain. And what we find is sort of, I think music is probably one of the domains with the longest history of this individualized training where you have a teacher who guides a musician <clears throat> to gradually refine the skills that they are uh, acquiring. 
And music, it's interesting. There you almost have a schedule for the first 12 years of studying piano where there is an increasingly difficulty in the kind of skills. So you have to acquire certain skills so you would then be able to acquire the more complex skills. And that, I think, is really interesting when I talk to uh, coaches in sports is that they often say that sometimes they encounter 14-year-olds coming to them and they have now spontaneously learned the skill without really having acquired the fundamentals that seems to be the basis that you need to have in order to now keep improving. So that's kind of a problem, having to relearn the fundamentals when you're 14 and maybe spend an entire year not essentially getting better, but just sort of getting on track so you would then be able to, you know, further refine your skills to reach the highest levels. Yeah, in, in terms of like um, uh, piano, that, that reminds me of um, back when I was a child. I, I uh, uh, competed for many years until I graduated high school in, in solo uh, a piano competition uh, on the state level. And it's, um, it's very, it was very regimented and, and structured. Um, but a lot of listeners, they, they're, you know, finding their passion or, or still trying to figure that out. Or they're, maybe they're dabbling in uh, passions that aren't as structured and regimented. Um, for example, um, I'm, I'm experimenting with, you know, a dream of maybe being a talk show host of some sort. So when, when, when those um, skill sets are, are new or, you know, don't have that large amount of people who are teaching them, um, do you have any uh, tips on kind of uh, um, still improving in a efficient way there? Well, I think that's interesting. And, and I believe here that with this technological change, it's not possible to kind of almost, uh, you know, do videos where you can document the development of other individuals. And I believe that as we're now starting to see individuals documenting their development, and sometimes it's parents who are kind of documenting how their children develop, we'll have a much better understanding of what it takes to reach a certain level of performance. And I think as a talk show host, there are probably individuals that you particularly admire and feel are actually doing a very good job. So I guess one possibility would be for you to think out how would you be able to make yourself valuable to a person like that so they would then be willing perhaps to spend time and give you feedback and share some of the insights that they have of what it took to basically get to the place where they are. Fascinating. And, and I think very often, you know, students really don't take that opportunity of seeking out people, because I believe, especially when you have people <clears throat> who reach kind of their career end, they are not going to be competitive with the students, but actually view now this as an opportunity to share, you know, their insights that now the students can benefit from and, and it's sort of you have that nice relationship where the student that can now <clears throat> offer that kind of perhaps uh, opportunity to kind of test out ideas that you never really got a chance to do but essentially that very successful teacher-student relationship where the student is now at the center and the teacher is now motivated here to really help the students succeed. Hmm. So it's so it's basically a, a mixture of kind of, you know, seeking out those mentors and finding win-win relationships with them and, you know, studying their lives and, and kind of seeing how, how they did it and so forth. Right. You know, and, and I do think that especially in business, you know, there are individuals who at some point in their career are moving o over to the university and doing teaching as examples here of people who, you know, are more interested now in sharing their knowledge. 
The only thing I would say, though, is that I've run into kind of teachers who are interested in basically more or less attracting paying customers in a way that I think really detracts from this idea that you are, you know, really trying to help your students. Uh, and I, I talked to golf coaches who told me that, well, you know, deliver practice, that's probably the way you get better. But many of their customers are, you know, middle-aged individuals, and they really come to the coach to feel better about their golf game. And, and basically by pushing individuals to get better, it's not necessarily the way that they would in, get the most enjoyment. So they spend more time kind of really emphasizing how they are now, you know, being able to express themselves in the game rather than necessarily now improving their performance. Right. So there's, there's that delineation that you have to make as an individual about what, what your goal is. Is it to just feel better about your golf game or is it to, you know, seek out that discomfort and feedback and make sure that your mentor or your coach understands that um, so that you get uncomfortable and get better? That's, is that what, that's what I'm... Yeah, right. You know, and, and, and what we see here in domains where you get better well, that really means that you're comparing yourself to a higher level of performance than you're currently at. And the problem is that just performing at that same level is not going to get you to that higher level. You really need to basically figure out what is it that you could change that would actually allow you now to get better. And, and that basically means that you're going to spend a lot of time failing to reach that desired level until you eventually get to that point where you now can reliably get to that new point. And, and that, you know, I mean, uh, if you're interested, and especially I've been talking to surgeons, if you think that you can actually be more successful and your patient will have better outcomes, I think that's a really kind of strong motivation for many surgeons to take a hard look at you know, basically, anytime we, they do a surgery, to review it and think about how could I actually do this better? And I think that's something that I see, you know, in people who are very successful is that, you know, they don't, you know, kind of enjoy, and, you know, just say, oh, I'm great. Uh, in fact, you know, every time when they perform, they ask, you know, what could I have done better? Because that sort of is uh, the path by which they will actually continue to improve. Yeah, I, I saw. So in the book, there's actually quite a few, um, and this is what I love about the book. There's there's all these uh, this research and, and case studies of different um, examples of surgeons and nurses and uh, you know even athletes where um, it showcases how the you know the ones that failed to or maybe it's because of the corporate uh, structure. They were never obliged to look at um, their work and figure out what they could have done better. And then when you cross-analyze this over a long period of time, we find that the ones, those people um, didn't seem to improve at all in terms of saving lives and so forth. Um, so uh, my question is, um, in terms of... Um, you know, how we can kind of analyze this and, and incorporate um, another Im important term, mental representations. Uh, how, how does that uh, work together um, other than just, uh, you know, look at our work haphazardly and say, I think I could have done that better based on just opinion? Right. And what we find, and I think this is particularly true for recreational uh, athletes like golf players and tennis players, you know, they kind of keep improving until they get to a point here where they can actually play fun games here with their friends. But what's interesting is that they pretty much remain at that same level, even if they play several times a week, unless they actually now take a look at and see what is it that I could actually have done better? And that's often, you know, when you seek out a coach, they will be able to see now 
what is it that you could possibly improve here in the next couple of weeks? And how would we be able to design now a training? Because the problem when you're just having that kind of game experience, you're not going to repeat those situations. You're going to maybe make a mistake, you know, when you're trying to do a volley when you're playing. And it's going to take maybe two or three games before you actually encounter the same situation. And at that point, you're not going to be any better prepared. So if you imagine a situation where you're working with a coach, they will actually be able to give you now the correct fundamentals and start out easy. And as you get more and more proficient, you know, they will actually make it harder. And eventually they will embed it in actual games where you now will be able to integrate now your new skills uh, to enhance uh, your playing performance. Right. Yeah, and um, another thing I, I really liked about your book was um, the whole idea that uh, there's a there's a section for people who are not trying to become the number one best champion in the entire world at a skill, uh, because many people really do just want to have a moderately better life, and they're not trying to uh, move heaven and earth to to get to that level. And there's this great case study in this book about this this um, average man who wrote to you many years ago, uh, seeking to improve his golf game, and and uh, ended up achieving quite a high level with deliberate practice. Um, so in terms of uh, that category of people, um, do you have any advice for for getting along and and improving that sense? And, and I'll start you off. I, there's this one part in the book where uh, you mention how. Uh, if you're just starting off and learning the fundamentals, you don't need to find some world-class coach and pay a lot of money to just learn the fundamentals. Anyone with a moderate amount of experience w will do. Yeah, and, and I think you're making a great point here that, you know, life is too short. And if you really want to be world-class, uh, it's likely that you will only be successful in one domain. And, and I think, you know, most people have all sorts of interests. So I think it's important here to kind of almost decide on what is the level that you want to achieve. And one thing that rarely people provide you information about is how much practice and training would you need to get to a certain level? Then you could conceivably be able to make an informed decision. You know, this is something that I want to you know, commit to, or you would say, you know, this is more than I'm willing to commit to. So basically then you would pick another level or you may decide you want to achieve a, a performance in some other domain. But that kind of informed decision of, and knowing more about how long and what type of training that would be required for you to get to sort of a performance level that you have seen in other people that you admire. Awesome. So in terms of um, uh, making these mental mo rental representations uh, work, um, can you, you know, some of my listeners, they're not familiar with this concept. Could you talk a little bit more about this? I know there's, it's, it's also referenced on the internet as a mental model, um, but in the book, it's, it's called a rep mental representation. Yeah, and that's kind of one of the initial insights that we had when we started this work. So if you ask an expert to think out loud when they're performing a challenging task, you get insight into what's happening in that person's head. And by comparing you know, what they are paying attention to and having somebody less skilled do a similar type of task, you can see that the expert is now able to have a much more refined description of the current situation. And they can actually mentally explore options and actually determine the consequences of those options without actually doing them. So that's basically what we talk about as mental representations. And a typical example would be a chess player who is in a complex situation. They will actually explore two or three different types of moves and then basically 
be able to determine if I do this, what is the best counter move that my opponent can make? And if he does that, you know, I would do this. And then you can see that you're likely now to be able to, you know, kind of make gains if you select one move uh, in contrast to some of the other ones. So that kind of mental representation supports that ability of mentally reason and maybe a composer can generate sort of a sound experience and then ask, how would I be able to generate this sound experience on the piano so other people can actually, uh, you know, be able to listen to it. And, and that's kind of one of the general kind of characteristics of experts. So if you look at soccer players, for example, and you have them watch a soccer game and then you blank out the screen and you ask, what should the ball handler do in this situation? The better soccer players are able now to basically tell you what are the useful options and even maybe recommend one particular thing that you would do that is superior now to less skilled soccer players. And, and I've yet to actually find a domain where you don't see all that mental mediation that is associated now with a superior, a superior performance of those individuals who excel. Yeah, yeah, it reminds me of um, um, something uh, Josh Waitzkin, um, a national chess player, mentioned uh, briefly in his book, The Art of Learning, how he kind of, he started with a base layer of mental models and he kind of builds on top of them like a pyramid and, and chunks them until he intuitively can chunk more and more. Um, so that's, it's very fascinating how that, this was also um, discovered and, and referenced in this research as well. Um, uh, let's talk about passion. Uh, that's a very commonly thrown, thrown around phrase nowadays. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, passion in its, in its place in terms of uh, mastery? Well, when it comes to a lot of these sort of personality uh, psychological characteristics, I find that I have a problem with how they're being assessed. Uh, so if basically the method that you assess somebody's passion is to have them fill out a questionnaire, and then basically you have one person that, that's not classified as passionate and somebody else, I, I don't really feel that that is really going to help us understand. <clears throat> so maybe I should ask you, how would you know if a person is passionate? Would you be able to observe that in some kind of behavior? And if so, what would that behavior be different for somebody who is passionate and somebody who is not? Well, I would, I would say I would observe them over a at least a month because uh, they could be very enthusiastic on day one, but you know, would they be doing this on a eight hour window every day after the, the high wears off? Um, but, but to answer your question, I, I would kind of gauge enthusiasm and um, genuine enjoyment and, and kind of assess if they, they really enjoy what they do. So, so we kind of approach this in the opposite direction. So if you look at those individuals who are willing to set aside, you know, three, four hours a day where they actually continue to challenge themselves, trying to do things that are really changing their performance. And, and we, when we ask even the people who are the most successful, they don't consider that process to be enjoyable. What they focus in on is actually the result of that process. So we argue that when you find individuals who make that commitment to something, that that, you know, would be a measure of their motivation. And, and when you look at a lot of other individuals in these domains, they seem to be more kind of focused on the more immediate enjoyment. You know, they want to play games or they want to kind of produce music without really a concern here of, you know, doing it in such a way that 
you would have an audience that would really enjoy uh, the music that's being produced. So, so basically, by looking at the activities that these individuals, you know, are willing to commit to, and what we find is that musicians, you know, they have 10, 15 years of basically having made that commitment. And, and sometimes it's very clear when you talk to them that they made a choice, you know, during basically the teenage years, they may have gone to less parties than other individuals who ended up basically not being as successful in the same domain. Yeah, this was one of the hardest uh, pills for me to swallow while reading this book. Um, I, I still kind of see passion as something that um, is, is important to kind of get through the process because I hear it so often from uh, successful people. But to underscore and emphasize um, uh, what was said here, um, uh, it seems to be there's, you know, the successful people who reach a high level seem to be the ones who um, you know, are, are willing to uh, go through that pain period of and that discomfort of the work and, and they don't enjoy that but they, they get their enjoyment from the the success and the progress they make more so than from the work and so it's you know it's not like they're happy and joyous all the time while, while doing this task they they also experience discomfort right and, and I think that's an important uh, kind of message maybe for parents even, that, that if you want to help your children, you know, develop that ability of actually, you know, going through a process to reach certain kinds of goals, that's kind of a habit uh, like some other habits. And if you as a parent can actually help your children, you know, acquire those habits early, then at least a child has that option of applying it once they find now something where, you know, they really enjoy it. And, and I'm not saying, you know, that people who are successful don't get joy out of the success. It's more that what they kind of enjoy are the things that are hard that other people now admire. Uh, and, and, you know, so being able to perform in front of an audience, well, you really have the sense here that you influence how that audience feels I think that is kind of a, a really, you know, major enjoyment that somebody can have. Now, basically, after they've done their performance, you know, they may actually start reviewing and seeing here, you know, I could have done a little bit better here, a little bit better there. And that now gets the stimulus uh, for them uh, when they have an opportunity now to, you know, practice and, and refine their performance. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of our, our listeners are Asian American, and I think that's uh, this point is uh, very, uh, very important for them because uh, their parents are very good at structuring and regimenting a training routine for their academics as well as for their, their music life. You know, they, many are shipped off to take uh, violin lessons or piano lessons. Um, but then, you know, as they grow up, they really start to d dislike the, the whole planned approach because now they're going to maybe med medical school and they don't enjoy what they do. Um, that said, they often get very far and excel because of this practice, but it, you know, it stops sometimes, you know, in, in their 20s or 30s. Um, so, so. Do you have any uh, feedback on kind of reconciling the deliberate practice and, and the, the enjoyment of it? It seems to be more focused towards uh, maybe, you know, from what you just said, uh, looking for things that you get the enjoyment from the, the feedback and the, the growth and the, the work process. Well, I think this is a great uh, question. And what I find is that if you look at music students who seem to excel, they develop these representations that allow them to really enjoy the music that they can produce themselves. So it's, you know, they have these representations and those are very helpful when you're actually criticizing 
your own work or other people's work, but it also gives you that opportunity of actually sitting down and producing music that is now enjoyable to you. And, and that's actually one activity that I think is kind of interesting is finding music students who can spend a couple of hours kind of playing around around a piece. Now that's very different from the deliberate practice activity, but they can now actually sense how they are now able to produce experiences that go beyond basically what they were able to do. And I think that's a kind of a key idea that as a parent, you shouldn't kind of keep control over your children. You should actually help them become in control of their own performance development. And that basically, when it comes to science or any kind of professional activity, I think that's when you now feel like you can now achieve better outcomes as a surgeon or whatever it is. And, and ultimately, if you want to be extremely successful as a musician, you need to basically accomplish something that people haven't done before. So if you are a perfect copy of other people, that's going to be much less recognized than if you, as a refining now your way of thinking about music, are coming up with something that other people will characterize as an innovation and something that goes beyond what other people have already done. And that, I think, ultimately has a lot of rewards associated with it that explorational activity, whether you're a scientist or an artist or whatever you do. Yeah, that was that was a good answer. And I think I'll, I'll definitely be sharing that uh, with people uh, when they reach out and ask. Um, in terms of, um, uh, so, so in terms of uh, the next question, which is on uh, translating skill sets, I found this uh, fascinating. So in the book, um, there's a thought that was put out, which is that, well, what about this one guy who didn't seem to spend more than a couple hundred hours at this high jump uh, sport, and now he's a world champion? Um, clearly, it's not just about deliberate practice and hard work. And, and the, the point that was posed in the book seemed to be that, well, actually, he was he spent thousands or hundreds of hours playing basketball before then, and a lot of those skills translate. So um, how, how can we apply this? Like I, I'm looking as myself as an example to illustrate, and I see my um, a long period of uh, piano practice kind of put to waste after I graduated uh, high school and went to college. So perhaps that could mean translating the musical knowledge I got there to maybe pop music or EDM, is, is that possible? Or is, and is that what you were getting at? Well, I, I think our main point was that when you look at these seemingly amazing performances that doesn't seem to kind of reflect innate skill, once you look at the history that these individuals have had and also look at what are the really constraining factors for being successful in high jumping. It's basically your strength and your lower body that allows you now to get a lot of uh, force that allows you to kind of get the height that's necessary. And it turns out that that's actually quite similar to what a basketball player is trying to practice in order to be able to dunk the ball and other things. So the argument is that once you take that into account, uh, you can actually explain why somebody seemingly was able to perform at a high level with much less practice. The other issue of you know how you can use things and skills that you've developed, I think is an interesting one. And, and I think there are examples of people who are true innovators who are basically borrowing ways of thinking about things in one domain and then actually applying it to another domain. So Paganini, for example, uh, he's often cited as somebody who took the skills for guitar and actually you know, incorporated them in violin playing and was able to 
to do some some really at the time truly amazing things that are now incorporated in the training of of, of basically violinists uh, across the world. But I think it's almost you know and, and creativity I think is I view that as something that is on top. So it's almost like we know how you can become and develop your ability to do all sorts of things, you know, and have developed skills and tools, but essentially putting that together and producing now something that hasn't been done before, you know, that obviously uh, is a slightly different process. But if you don't have the tools, imagine that you could image something but you couldn't really communicate it to anybody else because you don't have, you know, the skills as a visual artist. That's basically what I would argue, that if you acquire the skills, so you now actually are able to, you know, externalize images and ideas that you have, you know, then but you really need to have those skills to even make it possible. And I also believe a little bit that, your ability to actually construct these things in your mind, these are the result here of developing abilities and being able to kind of assemble and, and reproduce a lot of things that other people can do that now provides you with the kind of building blocks that you then can put together into something that is truly unique. One of the things I want to emphasize um, is the importance of uh, kind of starting from scratch and being able to get to um, a desired level or, or close to it with um, many different skill sets. In the book, you, you, uh, you look at certain studies on memorization from uh, people who are cab drivers in London and how they uh, memorize incredibly vast, complex maps and, and their brain uh, regions increase in that area. Um, and then you take a case study of a ordinary student and how he got up to something like 74 num numbers that he could memorize at once and the, uh, you know, the practices and techniques. Um, so you've had a lot of experience and research in these industries with um, not just ordinary people, but high, high performing people, sometimes world, world class competitors and um, uh, from from that experience um, and, and from your research, uh, is there anything you kind of want to impart on on how how they were able to um, to do that and, and um, you know uh, in terms of the the inspiration you want to give these listeners um, as, as a uh, as a kind of tip, what 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 do you want what do you want to say to them? Well, I, you know. I think when it comes to deciding your path, uh, I think, you know, just looking at myself, I think I pretty early on, you know, was really curious about all sorts of things. So for me to commit to science, and I think in some ways it started as an interest of just trying to understand how I would be able to improve my own thinking and then when I did my PhD, I basically developed methods for, you know, recording what other people were thinking and, and using this methodology of having them think out loud as a way of getting insight into, you know, what's going on in people's minds. And, and I think, you know, it's kind of just looking back. I mean, that's, I started, you know, with my dissertation and, and I think you can see sort of a thread that goes all the way up to uh, today, where that way of really trying to externalize thinking and try to understand now what the structure of that thinking is. And then I guess as, you know, in the last couple of decades, I've been interested in, you know, what is the training that helps people now acquire these mental representations that seems to be, you know, the hallmark of somebody who is exceptional. But I, I think one thing that is kind of interesting and important that sometimes people don't think about is that once you make a commitment to any kind of domain, uh, 
professional or uh, whatever, that commitment, you know, has implications for your social life. And I think finding like-minded individuals that basically you will now be able to interact with. And, and I remember talking to uh, some of the violinists at this uh, famous uh, music academy in Berlin. <clears throat> they told me that when they basically have given up on dating quote, normal people, because normal people wouldn't understand their commitment to basically want to be fresh in the morning so you could actually you know, work on improving your performance. So when they went to a party, it was sort of, you're going to have that conflict between just enjoying yourself and then maybe not getting enough sleep so you would be able to you know, be fresh in the morning. So what they found was identify somebody else who is committed to some other domain and they will kind of understand you and your priorities and that will be a much more kind of enjoyable and healthy relationship and i think this idea of designing an environment that is actually supportive to you including mentors and teachers and stuff like that i think is something that uh, some people don't think about and if they think about it it's maybe later than it ideally should have started thinking about it because it has now constrained some of their, you know, options in terms of where they might be able to, you know, go. Yes. So wrapping up here, uh, last few questions. Um, uh, I do want to touch on the 10,000 hour rule popularized uh, by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, so if, if anyone's not familiar, it's basically how um, people have seen it as, you know, this, once you reach 10,000 hours of work, that's when the heavens will open and you'll be a master. But that's not always the case. And, and uh, I, I'd like to know your thoughts on, on this rule. I, th I think you, you'd probably say that it's more about how you practice. Right. So, so uh, it's actually Gladwell that made that statement, but he did it basically looking at our research on the uh, students at the Music Academy, where we found that the top group on the average had basically practiced like 10,000 hours at age uh, 20. Now, if you really want to win a violin competition or a piano competition, it's probably going to happen in your early 30s. So by that time, you probably have accumulated like 25,000 hours of this type of, you know, highly structured, deliberate practice. So there's really nothing magical about the 10,000 hours. And maybe even more importantly, he talked about the Beatles playing a lot in clubs. And we would argue that that's really not deliberate practice if you're just kind of going around performing and we've reviewed a lot of evidence showing that somebody who's been doing a job for 10 or 20,000 hours wouldn't necessarily be even better than the average person. So basically, if you want to improve, you have to make that commitment to, you know, identifying things that you can improve, ideally with the help of a teacher. And it's really that commitment of actually setting now higher and higher goals, that is what drives development of performance. And there's some domains where I guess you can become international level after, you know, only a couple of hundred hours of, of basically a, a sort of practice. So skydiving. Now skydiving is so incredibly expensive that, you know, basically accumulating many hours and it takes a lot of time for you, you know, just to kind of get up in the plane and getting your parachute and everything, you know, basically uh, taken care of. So there are many activities that are severely limited on how much you can actually do them. And in those domains, you often find that the people who are at the top, you know, they've done a lot more than most of the other people, but it's still not even close to 10,000 hours. 
Oh, that's very interesting. So you, it's essentially about kind of seeking out those those domains or careers or skills where there's less competition or less time that you can invest in it. Right. You know, and, and I think if you find, uh, and I think that's, if you look at the people who've been very successful here in the information age, you know, like Bill Gates, he, he found an opportunity that basically provided him with all sorts of kind of pathways that would be very hard for somebody else to recreate. I mean, that was a little bit like Columbus, you know, uh, basically he had the chance and he discovered America that basically rules out somebody else now replicating that uh, and getting credit for it. So uh, I think, you know, spending time thinking about problems and issues, and I've actually been reading biographies of scientists and somebody like Pasteur, who is a Nobel Prize winning scientist who discovered, you know, basically the bacteria and, and, and you know, how they influenced, you know, disease and also, you know, other kinds of industrial processes. He apparently spent like two or three years just thinking about different topics that he would want to commit to. And he basically now identified this as a really kind of curious issue here. You know, how could one basically, where is the kind of some of these phenomena like disease, where it's coming from, you know, and, and basically uh, by studying now more details and using the microscope, you know, he was able now to kind of find the causes of these processes. So I think if you could find a, a good social problem or a good kind of issue uh, that you're interested in, and, and sometimes, you know, there may even be people in your you know, in your family who has certain kinds of problems, that would be kind of a starting point for you wanting to make a difference for them and indirectly now addressing a societal problem. Awesome. So my final question for you is, um, you know, do you have any parting words for, for anyone who's listening to this, uh, who is, uh, you know, struggling to uh, break through a plateau or unsure what they want to do with their lives um, that they can take action on and, and, and use immediately to improve their situation? Well, I would say that spending time and identifying people that you admire. Uh, and I would assume here that especially if you spend time looking, you would actually identify uh, those kinds of people and, and I remember actually at various points in my career when I was sort of wondering what I would be doing next, I, I found that reading biographies of people that I really admired was really inspirational and in some ways also gave me insight into what these individuals went through. And, and it, I think it's surprising how many very successful people actually went through this phase of, of really having a lot of struggling to do in order to get to uh, basically a, a position where they actually, you know, were able to demonstrate their performance and their success. And uh, so I, I don't know, that would be my uh, recommendation. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Uh, Erickson. Uh, once again, uh, the book is Peak Secrets from the New Science of Expertise. It's a brand new book. And I highly recommend you check it out. Thanks so much for uh, listening to the podcast. See you guys all later, guys and girls. Thank you.